This comes out very clearly in, uh, in the Vicente story, namely that in neoclassical economics, okay, savings are uh, the supply of capital and uh, they are the result of an intertemporal consumption preference, okay? Where individuals are the way they evaluate whether to have more consumption in the future relatively to today. So this gives, so savings are a consumption decision, okay? The consumption relatively to the future, instead. The increase in the supply of capital should be met by an increase in the demand for it, and this is investment. So, on the basis of the principle of supply and demand, which we get from all neoclassical economics, there should be a price that, collect, that, that, that connects the demand the supply of capital to the demand for capital. The demand for capital is investment. This price is the rate of interest. Do you understand? But the increase, the, 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 the supply of investment is the same as the supply of capital. This means that an increase given given the level of L of labor, an increase in the availability of capital under the principle of diminishing marginal productivity means that the marginal productivity of capital will fall. Do you understand? Because capital, all factors of production operate on the principle of diminishing marginal productivity. So savings are the supply of capital, investment is the demand of capital, they are brought into equilibrium by the rate of interest. Investment is also the increment in capital. Investment means more machinery, more, more capital stock in the economy. On the basis of the principle of marginal productivity, this means that now the new level of capital will produce at diminishing marginal productivity conditions. Okay, with the lower marginal productivity. Understand? So you mean as more capital is used? As more capital is more is added. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Invest, investment is a net addition to capital. In, in equilibrium, this means that the marginal productivity of capital must be equal to the rate of interest. Okay? Do you understand? So because you say that the rate of interest were to be lower than the, than, than the marginal productivity of capital, at this point you would have a situation of cumulative inflation, right? That would be because the, the, the return on capital would be lower, would be higher than the rate of interest. Hmm? So the, there would be a tendency for the demand for capital to outstrip, to be bigger than the supply of capital. Do you understand? Do you understand this? Yes. If, if the marginal productivity of capital, just to make the assumption, the, the marginal productivity of capital is lower, is higher, than the rate of interest, this means that there will be greater investment demand. You understand? Yeah, because the, because the rate of interest is lower than the rate of return on capital. Hmm? 
Yeah. Could you please explain how the rate of interest can be determined? Is it established by the authorities or is it? No, the rate of interest, no, no, the rate of interest is the natural market that operates in terms of supply and demand, the supply of savings, okay, the supply of savings in the market, they look for demand, and the demand comes from, from investment. Yeah? The no supply of savings have to be met by a demand of, of by demand, the demand, demand for capital. Supply of savings are supply of capital. And investment is the demand for capital. The result, so in the market they must meet, it, like you meet the supply of oranges with the demand for oranges. So it's not your savings <coughs> that establishes. It's the it's called the natural rate of interest. And it is, it is going to be put in price for capital investment, right? Sorry? Uh, this interest rate is equal to price yeah. for capital investment. That's right. It has to be because if the rate of interest is lower than the marginal productivity of capital, which is also the price of capital, the marginal productivity, if it is lower, investment will be greater than savings. Do you agree with that? And this, this creates a situation, we are talking about equilibrium conditions, therefore this will create a situation of disequilibrium. So this can go on for a while, I'm not saying that this is not good, but eventually the system must converge to equilibrium. That is a separate situation in which the rate of interest is equal to the marginal productivity of capital. Do you understand? That's, so, once you establish that, you also see that the distribution between the factors of production depends on the relative abundance or the relative scarcity of the factors themselves. Right? So, in this example, capital has been increased because I say there is an intertemporal consumption preference and savings are being generated for future consumption and as a consequence you will have an increase in the supply of capital. The, the, uh, the interest rate must bring into equilibrium the demand for capital, which will have to be lower now than the previous situation simply because marginal productivity of capital is now is now lower. Okay? And This also means that the economy, I kept labor constant, I always keep one thing constant. Uh, this also means that the economy is moved to a more capital intensive techniques of production, okay? So the rate of interest in neoclassical economics is, expresses intertemporal consumption preferences, okay? expresses intertemporal consumption preference, which this is what generates the savings, so it has to express the equilibrium intertemporal consumption preference. It expresses the equilibrium between investment and savings, and it also expresses, so three things it does. It also expresses the technique of production in the economy. A high rate of interest means a low capital intensity of production, right? Which means that capital is more expensive because it's less abundant relatively to, uh, to labor than it would have been the case before. <coughs> the conclusion is that the rate of interest is like any other price, real price, not monetary price. So the rate of interest in your classical economics is not a monetary phenomenon. It's a real phenomenon. It's, it's a real thing uh, which comes out of the operation of the market. Hmm? Especially the market for capital. Demand and supply. This is, and it determines, this price determines the distribution of income. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's the story. Well, Keynes 
rejected especially the view that the rate of interest was a purely was a real price. He rejected that. You have that. So we have to go back now again to the neoclassical. So it's impossible to understand things if you don't understand the neoclassical. So. So, so supply and demand conditions are all determined in what's called the real economy, the real uh, world of transactions for goods, services, etc. See, money does not enter. I never mentioned money here. So where does money enter into the picture? The money enters into the picture through the quantity theory of money. Hmm? Through uh, the quantity theory of money was actually invented by David Hume, the famous British philosopher. But it became a, a, monetary, a full monetary theory in Cambridge, UK, in the, at the end of the 19th century. Hmm? And so the, the, the uh, quantity theory of money tells you that money as gold, as, as, as a stock of money, money as gold, okay, is determines the absolute price level only. Do you follow me? So, if this is the stock of money as gold, <coughs> okay, and, uh, and this is what's called the velocity of circulation of money, that's capital V, mm -hmm. so how many times, you know, come out a, 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 a coin changes hands, that's the velocity of circulation, how fast the money circulates in the economy. You follow me? Because it's not that you have a, you have a banknote of whatever, 20 uh, euros and dollars, etc., and you pounds and so forth, and you exchange, it, it circulates many times in the economy, right? So that's called the velocity of circulation of money. It has to be equal to the price times the number of transactions in the economy. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, transactions are really, is not, is really income. It, it, it is pro transactions are connected to income. We have transactions once in, in connection to income. You follow? So, transaction strength stands as a proxy for total national income. And therefore, you can derive this as MV equal to PY. Okay? So, if the velocity of circulation is constant, okay, that's the, what is being assumed, constant velocity of circulation, given the level of income, money determines uniquely the level of prices, if you read the equation that way. That's how it's supposed to So that the stock of money, you increase the stock of money, you throw more gold into as coins, eh? you increase the supply of money, you will increase the price then. Okay? That's, that's the story. So, but why is that income has been taken uh, as given, as exogenous? It has been taken as given exogenous because it is assumed that this, this is real income, okay, real yeah, physical output. This is all resolved at the level of real market, real transaction, in terms of supply and demand conditions that we discussed before. Okay? So the conclusion is that, see, the rate of interest doesn't show up here at all. There is no rate of interest. Where is the rate of interest in this equation? 
So money does not affect the real world. Do you understand? And, and, and the rate of interest is not affected by money. That is the, the, the quantity theory of money that was developed in, in the, but initially the idea was uh, David Hume who was thinking about the Spanish inflation. That was, uh, <coughs> but that was several hundred years ago. At the end of the 19th century, that was thought up in England, uh, in Cambridge, and that it, it fitted pretty well. It seemed, it seemed to fit pretty well the situation of the time because the, 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 the international, well, the, the relevant international monetary system that existed at the time was based on the gold standard, the chart on the gold standard. Yeah? And it actually fitted very well the British view of the situation. Yeah? Because Britain owned most of the gold in the world. Britain and the United States. Okay? Because gold was found, was South Africa, Canada. So Canada and South Africa were part of the British Empire. Commonwealth Empire. Okay, the other um, part was so uh, uh, Australia also was part of the British Empire, so that was was gold. And so the, the, the real the two areas where were not part of the British were the Amer United States gold mined in the United States and gold mined in Russia. Okay, these were the two the two uh, areas in the Euro. So the, gold mines. But the British actually owned a lot of the gold mines in, in Russia as well, hmm? not those in the United States. Yeah? Uh, essentially, the British controlled most of the, of the gold in the world. So it appeared to them that that was the perfect theory to, to understand monetary, uh, monetary relations, monetary transactions. In reality, there is a very good book by, uh, by an Italian economist who is now quite well known in the sense he writes almost every I don't know now he writes every week, but before, until a few, few months, a few years ago, he used to write every week in the Italian newspaper La Repubblica. Uh, his name is Marcello De Cento. And he has written a book which is coming. Uh, very famous. He's written it. It's also been translated in English and so forth. It's called Money and Empire. In the English language. And that is a fantastic book. <coughs> because what he shows is that the this view applied to the gold standard is wrong. What it shows is that in reality, the position of Britain, Britain used still the international gold standard, the international monetary system was based on the gold standard, that's true. But it was not an automatic mechanism. Because this implies automaticity, automatic mechanism, okay? It was not an automatic mechanism. It was institutionally determined. That's the question that you asked. What is the, how is the rate of interest fixed? And what it shows is that Britain, because it controlled the gold, it could regulate the international monetary system according to its own interests, objectives, and so forth, by using the discount rate in London. Discount rate is the interest rate. That's what the discount rate is. So, in fact, Britain used the discount rate. It was to the, the control, the ability to, to, to manipulate, to change the discount rate that Britain organized its international transaction. And then eventually Britain lost the power to do that. And why did it lose it? Because two countries Two countries, especially one in Europe, but also two countries, basically 
eliminated the British uh, supremacy in export and, and prevented Britain from using the international financial system in order to finance its own deficit, do you follow? Because that's how Britain was operating. And the countries that, that basically eliminated the British supremacy in exports were numbers were two, two. They're actually the same importance, United yes. States and Germany. And Germany. And just by the end, what Marcello Vecinco argues is that the gold standard was doomed and, and in fact he he views the his view is that the economic relations were on the path of war between Britain and Germany because the country with the largest stock of gold was not Britain. It was Germany. It was the Reichsbank in Germany that had the largest amount of gold in the world. Okay? Because German of the power of German exports. And uh, the fact that German industrial exports has essentially uh, wiped out the British exports in Europe. And, uh, and as a consequence, Germany, which is not a new story, uh, you know, it is, it is the beginning of the story which still runs today. You know, the, the Germany became a major focus, a major area for the accumulation of balanced trade services. Because that's what, what happened with Germany, uh, essentially the Bismarckian type of uh, economics. And, uh, and so that Britain, according to the Czech, I think is essentially right, remained powerless. It could no longer use the discount rate on the international market in order to attract capital. Because of this big pool by, by, by Germany that basically the, the um, gold standard was no longer working for Britain, but it was working for Germany as a result of the German exports and the capacity to accumulate balance of trade services. Okay? But anyway, that was considered to be the, the perfect theory for a situation in which the gold standard prevailed. But see, there is no interest rate here, and the interest rate is determined in the real markets for, for supply and demand for capital. That's where the interest rate is determined. Okay? It's, it's the price which brings into equilibrium savings and investment. Okay? Now, this will <coughs> the production, the big cell production function, okay, is which is perfectly competitive and there is no leftover, you know, as we have no leftover, all the output is redistributed among those two factors of production, so there is no markets therefore are perfectly clear as a result of that. This and that create a picture of an economy <coughs> at the theoretical level of an economy which cannot go wrong. Okay? I use this term, this, this is a, the title of a letter that a very uh, big friend of mine, who is going to teach here next uh, term, after Jan Toporowski, he drafted a few years ago, 2009, he drafted a letter to the Sunday Times. And so I and circulated it among a bunch of us, and, and I signed it also, my another people signed it. And it got published in the Sunday Times. It's a short letter. It's a, it's a Toporovsky letter, short. Not, not long-winded, uh, you know, to, to, to the point. And because there was the debate then in England, but it was part of the debate of in the world, okay, about budget deficit, the crime, blah, 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 blah all this stuff. And, uh, and, uh, and there were a bunch of people Quite surprising, actually, because there was some. They, they sent a letter to the. I think it was a letter to the Sunday Times as well. That yeah, that the Toporovsky letter was a sort of 
counterweight to, to offset a letter that was sent by 60 colonies <coughs> in Britain to the Sunday Times. We were five, uh, those who signed. But, uh, and there was a kind of long letter in the financial in the, in the you know, I think it was in the Sunday Times as well. And in that letter, they said that the budget uh, must be brought under control, etc. Because you know, at the onset of the crisis, the budget went uh, out of the deficit. As it normally does you know, under these circumstances. So I still bring it back. And Jan Kaprowski has drafted that letter. It's a fantastic letter, you should, uh, because it's shortened to the point. He said, yes, budget deficit are not necessary. Okay, only if, they, if, if, if you assume that there is an economy that cannot go wrong, that is which, which is perfectly market clearing, that everything, that everything functions according to the rules laid out by the theory, whereby you have perfectly competitive general equilibrium bus. It doesn't matter what, uh, as long as you have equilibrium where supply and demand get uh, together. And, at that point, of course, you don't need any. You don't need. It's, it's irrational to have a budget deficit. If you understand, there is no need to have a budget deficit if uh, and markets always clear. You don't have unemployment. You don't have. Uh, therefore, if you, the moment you have unemployment, you immediately have to. You have less taxes coming in. Okay. And you still have social security expenditure going out, you know, unless you allow these people just to drop dead, you know. But that may not be so so useful you know, to allow because before they they drop dead, they also get a bit agitated. So I mean, it, so it's better not to. And so you need you have an outflow of social security expenditure. Uh, the previous commitment, the fire brigade, whatever it is that keeps it. Even if you cut it down, you still have to 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 finance the fire brigade or and so forth. Uh, imagine if they introduce productivity indices, productivity consideration in relation to fire to 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 to, to the fire brigade that operates in airports, right? Yeah, most of the time, the fire brigade action is nearly 100 percent, 99 percent of the time, the fire engines in the airport. <coughs> They do not work, right? They do not. I mean, they, they are not in operation, right? Because it's not that you hear every day there is a some fire in airports. It's, it's very rare. Mm -hmm. So imagine that they say that fire engines in the airport. I mean, all the airport services, including fire engines, have to show productivity productivity gates. The only way in which a fire engine a fire, a fire engine in the airport or other any other public thing can show productivity is that there are many fires and it's successful in putting them out. Right? There is not so, uh, therefore if they introduce productivity consideration into that sort of stuff, you should ex you should actually uh, decide uh, that in airports where fires are very rare you should not have fire engine, you should not have safety. Safety. That's the <laughs> but of course there is a minimal even among people who think in accounting terms, there is a minimal minimal rationality, so they keep you know they keep the fire engines and etc. in airports and other installations. And but when taxes go down because there is a recession and so forth, these expenditures keep going and you normally in a recession you have a budget deficit. Normally, not as a matter of policy. As a matter of accounting, less taxes but expenditure uh, expenditure keep uh, the action if you hold this theory here strictly the theory which Keynes called the treasury view. Right? He calls it in the 30s the treasury view. That okay, if I have a budget deficit, then I've got to tighten the belt mm -hmm. because we are living, we are so far living beyond our means. Right? That's a standard thing that you can hear. That you hear that you live, you are living. You know, we are consuming more than what we can. So the economy as a whole, 
society lives beyond its means. Uh, then they say, cut the, cut the budget. But this all starts from an assumption of an economy, from a theoretical un underpinning. The theoretical underpinning is that, is that the economy can never go wrong. Do you understand? It, it, it cannot go wrong. That's the theoretical underpinning. And that's what Jan Toporowski, if I find the, the letter, he said, yeah, if I, I have to go on to the website of the, not the website, Sydney University Library, we are subscribed, we subscribe to all the engines from newspapers and stuff. So I go into Sydney University Library and I get the Toporowski letter and I send it. It's a very clear cut letter. And, well, um, so this actually implies that Essentially, uh, the neutrality, this is called neutrality of money. That money is neutral. Money impacts not on the real output, but it impacts upon the price level. Okay? So, money is either inflationary or deflationary. So, if you reduce the stock of money, the price level will fall. Will fall. <laughs> if you increase the stock of money, given why, the price level will go up. But that's the law of, of money. That's how money functions in the economy. In that kind, in the neoclassical economy. And this also implies that the real, why is this not moving? This is not moving. Money does not impact upon why about income. So, because income is already settled, it's settled on the basis of the real transactions, of the transactions in the real markets for goods and services. So this is settled at the level of supply and demand mechanisms for anything from capital to oranges to labor, all this is settled here. It perfectly, con it perfectly contractive conditions prevail. This should be a full appointment. It's a normal thing. It's a normal situation. Okay? Therefore, money can impact only on the price level. Okay? You understand that? That's the, the quantity theory of money in its pure form. As I can say, it's all bound. This is all nonsense. Hmm? But it took him a long time to get to that. Thing. It was not straightforward. Because Keynes was himself neoclassical. Yeah? That was the only theory that existed that moved around. All right, there was some kind. Yeah, there was a guy called, you know, a guy called Charlie. Yeah? And there were, not considered, that was sort of from people, people uh, agitating. And anyway, Marxian economics was not taken seriously in Britain. They did not. The only place, the only places where they took it, the places where they took it seriously in historical sequence were Germany, Russia, Germany the socialist, the social democrat. Russia, all the, the whole intelligentsia took Marxian economics seriously. Because you had people like they were aristocrats of the aristocracy that uh, uh, intellectual, of course, I'm not a historian, it's just on horses. And they, uh, they took the mass very seriously. And in fact, one of the greatest, uh, most important contributions to a modern, a more modern view of mass, mass economics came from, from essentially people people in, 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 in the Tsarist, in the Russian Empire, because now there is Ukraine, all this nonsense, and then they say Ukraine. But, uh, but it's from, from Russia, okay? Uh, so there were, one was a prince called Dmitriev, a mathematical, very good mathematical person. Uh, another was uh, First of all, he became a minister of finance. There was a period he was called the People's Republic, People's Republic of the UK. That was a kind of intermediate uh, 
uh, period between between uh, Soviet Russia and Soviet Union. <coughs> you know, it was not the same. It was not the same. Uh, uh, as long as the people, so there was a guy called Mikhail Tugan Baranovsky. Yeah? A very important contribution to Marxian economics. And he was Minister of Finance in the People's Republic of Ukraine. So this is, uh, and another place where Marxian economics was taken very seriously, that was later on, huh? after the 20s and the 30s, Japan. Japan. Very serious development of mass economics in Japan. And later in the 50s, etc., India. I think India today still has the best uh, best thinking in mass economics because it connects with the Cambridge stuff and so it, it's really a more the Anyway, so. So, yeah. uh, I want to go back to this uh, Spanish inflation in the 16th and the 17th century, yeah. when you know gold was too much there and then inflation was inevitable. I want to ask whether wealth is constructed by the amount of gold one has, or it is based on the industrial devolution. But in Spain, there was no industrial revolution. So in this case? In that case, the quantity of money is correct. If you have industrial revolution means that output can increase, OK? And industrial revolution means that all transactions are essentially monetary transactions. That is, they require money all the time. And creation of wealth is a monetary form. It's not it, 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 it's created through production and money, OK? Therefore, if in the case of Spain, the, the, the issue of inflation was because output was not responsive, did not respond to the increase in the amount of gold. Because the conditions of production in agriculture, etc., you increase, you become richer, and say the conquistadores, they came back, they looted, everything killed, etc., came back, they had more, more, uh, they had more gold, money, whatever, in the pocket, they demand more things. Well, output is, does not increase, the result is that you have increased prices. So the quantity theory of money is actually not wrong in relation to a non-capitalist <coughs> setting. In relation to a capitalist setting, it's fine. But uh, it, it does not work because the, the relations operate. Money impact upon the real economy. There is an impact. These things are not <coughs> M and Y are not separate. <coughs> and this is what Keynes, that's his Keynes, this Keynes pointed out. But as I say, to get to the Keynes thing, Keynes himself took, took him a long time. A long time. Because Keynes was no classic. But he had one advantage. He had one advantage. One or two advantages. Number one advantage. Don't actually perhaps in one or two, but number one, uh, uh, um, number the, the number one advantage intellectually is that his father was professor of philosophy in Cambridge. Very important. So he, he came from a strong philosophical background. British philosophy, which means moral element and logic. Okay, this, are, this is British philosophy. Moral element. It's not German type of philosophy, okay? Or European or Italian, or, which is essentially very connected to Hegelism, to, to, to German idealism. In the case of Britain, it's moral element, moral sentiment, in the sense of other street, moral sentiment and and logic. Second is that he did his uh, his uh, first paper, 1911, 1911, for which he got rejected. He did not get uh, into like a something kind of a book, let's say, uh, for when he applied to be a fellow in a college. I think it was 
clinic. And, and I always get, because there are two important, uh, equally important colleges in Cambridge, and very big, uh, Trinity and King's. I never remember which, uh, which, uh, because the food is so disgusting that you see the, you know, <laughs> and, and, and it was either King or Trinity, two, and he applied for, uh, for a fellowship and he got rejected. Hmm? But the paper that he presented, which is a book, which is his first book, is on probabilities in the future. And it is on subjective probability. This is a very important factor. Uh, so subject, I, I, I talked about it at the beginning of this course. Subjective probability means that you cannot put a mathematical probability on the event. If you can put a, prob a mathematical probability on a field on an event, then you transform the event in something known. You know it. You know that it may happen. You follow me? It's like crossing the street. You know that there can be an accident. You know that. Mm -hmm. So you, you behave accordingly. You are more careful. You, are, you, you behave. You put a, You can put a probability on the event. The subjective probability theory eliminates this equation. Okay? And, and so that was his first training gun. But he was still in your last training, you know. The, the second advantage that he had is, is that I think it's really in relation to his philosophical background or something. <coughs> or also the influence of Marshall. He was very, very, very uh, smart in common sense. He, he understood issues. So even when he was not yet Keynesian, when he was not yet Keynes, right? when he did not invent the new thing, so he was not Keynesian, he always said quite sensible things. Yeah? And I think the most sensible thing, that is a, is a complete fantastic. It's actually it's more than sensible, it's extremely far-sighted stuff, is that he was a member of the British delegation to the Versailles Treaty, you know, to the peace treaty uh, between France, uh, France, uh, Britain, Germany, Italy, Austria, you know, in, in Paris. And the Prime Minister was Lloyd George, a liberal person, not conservative. Lloyd George was not conservative. And, and uh, Keynes was the advisor to Lloyd George. So he was, he was young, he was 37, 38, because he was born in, 18, uh, in 1883. 1883 plus 17 is 900, plus <coughs> 20, so, yeah, 37, between 36 and 37, 37. So, and, but 37 then you are already grown up person, it's not like today, 37 you are kind of moving in the true, true, but uh, <laughs> today, today, today uh, then 37 was already grown up person. People lived up to the point, the age of what, 62, 63, so he died at the age of 63, by the way. So I'm already five years older than Keynes. <laughs> so uh, he left the delegation, he resigned. Huh? He said, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Huh? And he was a good friend of Lloyd George, because later in the 20s he supported Lloyd George. I said, I, you are letting me down. I'm going here. You, you are crazy. You are, and why did he say that, you, that they were crazy? Because he said, you are going. Because the, issue, the only issue in Versailles was what, how to make Germany pay for the war, for the war expenses. Yeah? And, so the, and see, behind there was President Wilson of the United States. He was not part of the Versailles. America, America did not participate in the Versailles in the Soviet 
the number is an official thing. It was behind, it was out, outside kind of scheming. And but why? Because he did not want, he wanted the money back from France, because America financed the war of France, of uh, Britain, and Italy. Yeah? So he had, he wanted the money back. Said, I want the money back. Okay? No moratorium on the day, nothing. Money back, I want the money back. So the French and the British, they, put, they said, okay, they had to put a lot, they wanted to put a, a, a huge reparation payment on Germany, for Germany to pay for the, what Wilson, President Wilson, wanted back. That, that, that was the whole story, plus some money for themselves they wanted. And Keynes, Understood? He said, "Look, you are going." He said, "You are going to create a disaster here." And he wrote a book which became very famous, 1920 book, "The Economic Consequences of Peace." Economic. That is a fantastic book. Why is it fantastic? Especially if you read it uh, now. It is after after 1945. If you read it after 1945, so this, this, this person is a prophet. Right? Because he said Germany cannot pay those debts out of the question. They, you put on Germany so much reparation burden that Germany cannot pay. This will lead to a crisis in Germany. And he actually says 1920, this will create the conditions for a new war. He said that. Right? And he said, look, I don't want to have any party left designed from the delegation of the And he was not yet Keynes, and he was completely neoclassical. He was neoclassical, but he had common sense. He understood common sense. But what prompted Keynes rethinking, theoretical rethinking, was the depression of the third. And the answers, the institution and policies were giving to the depression of the thirties. You know, the, in universities all over Europe and also in the United States, today university academics are just zombies, okay? that have to write many, many papers because everything is judged on the number of papers that you publish, okay? And, and that's what they have to do, they, they write papers. The number of publications is what counts, right? And this is an American practice, by the way. The Americans wrote that here, you know, wrote that in, because the Americans started in the 60s late 50s to push for publications, 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 and then we, they, this practice became the criterion also in, the, in Europe and everywhere else. And so in, in, in those times, an academic, a respectable academic, would just write one book, one two books, no more. Yeah, one or two, it would be the, the book. So that person is known for this book, okay? You follow? So Pixel wrote two volumes of his own, that's it, two volumes of his own stuff. You know, two volumes, which was his lectures. By the way, the professor would write the lectures into the book. He would give lectures, lectures, write into the book. And then after the book published, the professor dies, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That was the mechanism. Yeah? So you don't have to look at how many. Only Marx was crazy, he wrote, wrote non stop. Yeah? But he was not part of the university. In the case of Keynes, Keynes set out to write the book. It was not the book that made him famous. It is another book, two volumes called. Uh? No. Jeff Thiers was really, that was not the book. The book was already, he wrote, it was published in 1930, and it's called The Treatise on Money. Two volumes. Treatise on Money. The Treatise on That is a Pixel book, a Pixelian book. OK? 
Okay? That's it's a very much influenced by the Excel. Yeah? It's an elaboration, intelligent, smart elaboration. Too verbose, in my view, because I, I could understand only 10% of it at the very most. And, uh, and there's business cycles, everything in it. But when the crisis hits the world, the 1929, the, the Great Recession, the, the, the Great Depression hits the world, he concludes by 1932, he says, no, I was wrong. That book, don't read it. Don't read it. It is. It's more than he himself said. So we, did not, we do not have the apparatus, the intellectual, theoretical apparatus to address this issue. We have to rethink the way in which the economy actually works. That's what, therefore he negates, he, he openly denies it. That book, don't read that, if you don't understand the present situation, that book that I have written for which, that was the book that was supposed to, he was supposed to die after that book and become famous, he didn't read that book. That, that, no, I cannot die now, because that book is not the appropriate plan. Okay, that is, uh, in 1930. And it starts, so that's incredible, you know, no academic today, in today's morality, which is very low, okay, uh, intellectual morality today is extremely low. And, and with today's morality, to that case, that statement by Keynes appears to be no academic would say, oh, look, my, my previous work is not, you know, don't, don't, I'm not thinking, I don't think that's valid anymore. No academic would say, because he would not get, he or she would not get grant, would not get, you know, uh, the necessary financing for research, etc. So I say, look what I've done, I've done this and this and this and that and this and that and that and that, etc. The whole list and everything is fantastic, everything has to be fantastic, you know. Uh, yeah. so, and he says, no, no, don't look at that book anymore. I'm going to rewrite a book. And he starts writing this book. He starts first lecturing, 1932. He comes out with the first draft of the book, which is all, no, it's all published in the, it's all published in the, his collected works. Uh, and he comes out with the, with the first draft, and the first draft is not called the general theory. Because the, the title of the book that made him famous is the general theory of, of uh, uh, employment, interest, and money. Employment, interest, and The first draft is called differently, and it's called a monetary theory of production. And then he changes the title because then he says, look, no one will understand anything. But it will not mean anything to them. So he changes the title later. But a monetary theory of production. Why? Because exactly because M has an impact on production. Why is production? Why is total income produced generally? So that's the first thing. A monetary theory of production. Okay? And the book comes out in 1936 and no one understands. Very, very few people understand. Very few. Uh, we'll take it after the break. Take it for